Now I bet you can. Gosh, Scott. I'm just going to blame Scott, even though it was me. Good morning. It's wonderful to have you with us this second Sunday of Lent. I had to think about that. This is the second Sunday of Lent as we prepare ourselves and continue to talk about spirituality. And thinking about spirituality, I would invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, pour out your spirit on us as we continue our journey. As we stop and think and understand that we can find spirituality in many different places in our lives. Fill us with your spirit as we continue to worship. Amen. As you're able, please stand and we'll sing hymn 427 together. the kids to come up. We just had to rescue a ladybug that we found in the playground, so we had to come on up here now. Come on up, Miss Hannah. Oh, there's another one. We have so many ladybugs in here. They're all coming in to hang out at church today. Okay, how's it going, friends? Did you have a good week? Yeah, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, last week, I wasn't here, but I did see that Pastor Stephanie talked with you all about the different things you see inside the sanctuary, right? You got to go and touch the table and feel the purple cloth. Do you remember what she told you all the purple and all the stuff in our sanctuary reminds us about? What season we are in? What do you think? Lent. We are in the season of Lent, and Lent is all these days and all these weeks that lead up to a big holiday. What is that one? to Easter, that is right. So we are right here in Lent, and during Lent, it's a really good time for us to think about our relationship with God and with Jesus, right? So I have some pictures that I wanted to share with you, hopefully, on the screen. Oh, there's one. So what does that picture make you think of? Jesus with kids, that's right. What is Jesus doing? Giving some hugs to some kids. That's right. Let's look at the next picture. What does that one make you think of? Jesus hugging one kid. There's one kid Jesus is getting hugs with. That's right. And then we have one more picture. Look at that one. 
What do you think about in that one? Yeah, hugging and kissing another kid, right? I found all these pictures of Jesus hugging kids. Do you know why I did that? Because I want you to imagine that you're one of those kids in one of those pictures. What would it feel like to get a hug from Jesus? What do you think it would feel like, Hannah? Just like when your parents give you a hug? Yeah, it would feel the same way. What else? How would it make you feel? What do you think, George? Good. It would make you feel good. Yeah, it would make me feel good too. So what I want you to do during Lent, as we think about all the ways that we can be closer to Jesus, I want you to think about a hug from Jesus. I want you to imagine what that would feel like. Go ahead and give yourself a hug. Give yourself a hug and give yourself a great big squeeze. And now imagine that it's Jesus, that Jesus' arms are all the way around you, comforting you, making you laugh, making you feel better, right? Do you feel all that love? Yeah. So a way we can be closer to Jesus during Lent is to just remember that relationship with him, right? Jesus' hug is for everybody. Everybody can get a hug from Jesus, right? So when you are feeling kind of sad or if you're feeling really happy, give Jesus a hug. Maybe you can do that during Lent this time. So that's my challenge to you all. During Lent, give Jesus some hugs, okay? Can we say a prayer? Hey, God. Thank you for hugs. And thank you for Jesus. Help us to remember that he is always there with open arms. We love you, God. Thanks for loving us. Amen. Okay, let's go to Sunday school. They love when they get to go to Sunday school. I want to remind you all that the United Women in Faith invite you to lunch following this service and that you are invited while there to both help pack period kits for the Wesley Center and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the Wesley Center. And I understand that our Director of Music and Worship Arts has been pressed into peanut butter and jelly service. I'm... Um, what? Uh, so I'm doing what she said. I invite you to prepare your hearts for both making peanut butter sandwiches later, but to giving your gifts to God in this time.
During the season of Lent, we changed things up a bit, and I apologize if the ushers didn't get the memo. Uh, instead of a call to worship at the earlier part of the service, we have been moving to a prayer of confession. I invite you to join me in that prayer of confession as we prepare our hearts. God of all people, our hearts are too narrow. Our perspectives are too small. We reject those who are not like us, those with different political opinions, those who struggle with illness of all sorts, those who disagree with us. We forget that, beloved children, we neglect your call to love one another. We choose to sit idly by when an opportunity to act for your good can be seen in the world. Forgive us, O oh God, for the many ways we have failed to be a people known by our love. Show us how to be more caring, more involved, more committed. Teach us how to love one another and make us faithful disciples, Lord Jesus. Con Continue to love us, Holy Spirit. Fill us with love so that the world will witness your love in our words and in our actions. Oh Lord, we come confessing those things that we have not been in this world. We ask that you would forgive us, that you would forgive us for all of the things that we know that you would request of us, all of the ways that we could be making a difference in this world. We ask that you help us to stop, to see what's happening around us, to care for those right in front of us, to look and see those who have needs, to look and see those who are ill, those who have been abandoned. Open our hearts to be your hands and your feet. O oh Lord, we look in this world and we see. We see difficult times and situations. We turn on the news and hope that the stories will have changed, but they continue. Open our eyes, open our hearts, fill us with your love, and remind us that when we fall short, you are there. You are there to forgive us, to give us strength, to give us renewed energy. Bless each of us as we journey through Lent, looking for spirituality around us, as we prepare to reach Easter, we remember this season as we remember the suffering of your son and as we remember how he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Regardless of what it says in the bulletin, I would ask that the choir come forward at this time to sing. regarded, oh, there it is, Joan Shimko wrote this piece, and she's widely regarded as an outstanding composer of choral music in America today. Her embodied approach to sound, dedication to craft, and insistence on quality texts all relate to her focus as a conductor and are reflected in her choral compositions. Her settings do not have a readily recognizable sound, but consistently display a discerning, insightful marriage of words and music. Her primary intention is to always illuminate and magnify the words she sets. In her words, during the last week of March of 22, I was focused on concert week preparations, Aurora Chorus was to perform Lifting As We Climb, a multi-movement 
choral narrative that not only commemorates the travails of generations of women seeking to join the democratic franchise, culminating in the passage of the 19th Amendment, but that also shines the light of truth upon the current attacks on voting rights, which are threatening democracy in the US. I could not help but ponder the connection between that concert and what was about, and what I was about to conduct, and, whoops, uh, I was about to conduct, and the growing fragility of democracy around the world, epitomized by the assault on Ukraine. Their people is our struggle. Democracy must prevail over autocracy. In binding these two songs together, it was my hope to create a worthy vessel for singer and listener to hold grief and to feel solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and with those suffering anywhere in the world where violence dominates human discourse.
Thank you, Cora. That was beautiful. Throughout Let, we're going to be talking about different times of ty and places of spirituality, ways that we find it within our own worlds, and hearing about different people's passions. We started last week with Wendy sharing a beautiful story of how play and joy brings joy into our lives, even in very difficult times. I don't think that anyone left with a dry eye. That was a powerful story. This week, we have Bruce Fest going to talk about the spirituality of activism, and it's all his fault we started this. He came to me one day, and he said, I'd like to sometime, you know, if you ever need a sermon, I could do one. And I said, well, what would it be about? And he told me, and I said, perfect, it'll fit right into this, although I didn't know yet what this was. And then one day, I talked to Terry Maker, and you'll hear from her last about her art, and she told me how people are so moved by her art, and she told me about Andy, and so she and Andy are going to tell her story. And I thought, okay, we're on a roll here. We've got something going. We have amazing people in this church. So this week, in a minute, you'll hear from Bruce. Next week, Elizabeth will be sharing with us about the spirituality of music, and the choir just proved that point for us. And then after her, Khan is going to talk to us about the spirituality of space. Very fascinating. So it's flowing and coming together, and it's been so moving for me just to hear what people are doing and, and to listen to their passion of life. And if that's not spirituality, I don't know what is. So throughout Lent, we'll be hearing about ways that we can be spiritual. And some of you may say, well, I'm not a pianist, or I don't think I'll ever get to go and do anything with space, or, but the question would become, what is it that your life, what is it that you can unfold about your own spirituality? Today's story is a familiar one. It comes from the Gospel of Luke at the 10th chapter. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the man said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the Samaritan said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus said, Let me tell you a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put the man on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him there. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of this man, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you might spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? He said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. Luke begins our story this way. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Who is this gentleman? Luke tells us he is an expert. We know that he is literate. 
and learned. He is well versed in the law. He knows the Torah and Moses, the revered lawgiver who gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments and much, much more. So this gentleman is no doubt very religious, very pious. We also know he is skeptical of outsiders. <clears throat> he is certainly suspicious of Jesus. He is testing Jesus. Basically, he's saying, I know the law, I've read the law, but I'm skeptical of you, Jesus. I don't know who you are, don't know where you're from. You're just some itinerant preacher from who knows where. You can't even read and write. So how do you know the law? But Jesus sidesteps this challenge. Instead, he engages the expert and asks, what is written in the law? How do you read it? The expert replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus tells him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Together they come to agree on the most important law, the great commandment, loving your God and loving your neighbor. This expert knows every jot and tittle of the law. So now the expert, he tempers his skepticism a bit. He's not quite so suspicious. He even turns curious and asks the practical question. Who is my neighbor? The, ex the expert is asking, how will I recognize my neighbor? Where is he? When will I see him? How will I know him? But let's think about this. The expert is really making an unspoken assumption that not everyone is his neighbor. Some are and some aren't. This expert is saying, so tell me, Jesus, how do I know who is and who isn't my neighbor? Those in my tribe. They're my neighbors, aren't they? What about those who aren't in my tribe? Are they neighbors or are they others? This tells us something about our expert's heart. It is half open and half closed. He sees some as welcome and worthy of love. Others, not so much. He doubts that he is a neighbor to those others. If not, he doesn't need to love them. Of course, Jesus doesn't answer his question, who is my neighbor? Instead, he tells a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So the first person we meet in this story is the neighbor. As our expert listens, what is going on inside his head? Oh, this poor man. What a terrible thing to happen to a fellow member of my tribe. Is his name Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, Abraham? Oh, he can't give his name, he's half dead. Is he wearing a tallet, a prayer cloth? Oh, he's stripped of his clothes. I can't tell where he's from, what he does, what his faith is. What color is his hair? Is it long, short, kinky? Is he dark-skinned, fair-skinned? What, what color are his eyes? Blue, gray, hazel, brown? This man's tongue, ethnicity, faith, and identity are a mystery. Who is he? Is he a heathen from Syria? Could be. 
One of those gay Greeks? Could be. Some traitor passing through Jericho on his way to Damascus? Could be. A descendant of those nasty Egyptians and their cruel pharaoh who enslaved my tribe? Could be. I can hear the expert asking himself these questions as he listens. He begins with only pious Jews in his elite circle of neighbors. But with each question he asks himself, the expert's small circle widens a bit. Heathens, gays, traitors, foreigners, and who knows who else creep into his circle of neighbors. So Jesus continues the story. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now the expert sees people in the story he knows and identifies with. They all belong to the same tribe. The priest is definitely an expert in the law and probably the Levite as well. Both are certainly religious and pious. Yet both pass by the man, beaten, robbed, and left half dead. As the expert listens, he must be asking himself, these fellows are in my tribe. They know the law. Why aren't they good neighbors? Jesus continues with the story. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put him on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any additional expense you may have. As our expert listens, he's confronted with an ugly fact. He and his fellow Jews see Samaritans as others. They are ceremonially unclean. They are heretics. When the Jews returned from their exile in Babylon, their temple had been destroyed, and they had to rebuild it. The temple was the Jews' holy and sacred site, the center of the, their faith, their life, their government, their culture, their identity. But the Samaritans, even though they were Jews, could not join in the rebuilding. Why? Because they weren't real Jews. They weren't orthodox enough. Simply put, for our expert and his tribe, the Samaritans were others. So they were excluded. This prejudice and bigotry endured for centuries down to the days of Jesus. The Levite and the priest, the ones in the experts' tribe, get it wrong. But the Samaritan, the other in the hostile tribe, the heretic, the very opposite of our expert, gets it right. This must be disconcerting for our expert. For him, the story that Jesus tells has a very sharp sting. In the beginning, the expert's question was, who is my neighbor? But Jesus didn't answer. Instead, when the story is over, he asks a different question. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Our expert in the law gives his answer. The one who had mercy on him. Yes, our expert gets it. His heart softens. The stereotypes and the exclusiveness, the bigotries and the prejudices are melting away. His heart opens. 
he becomes welcoming, affirming. He now knows who his neighbor is, and he now knows that the good neighbor is the one who acts with mercy. So Jesus tells the expert, go and do likewise. Our expert began by asking Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? Again, Jesus didn't answer. Instead, after the story is over, he tells the expert, do this. Love your neighbor like that Samaritan heretic did, and you will live. Not in some future eternity, but now, here, today. When our expert challenged Jesus, he was stuck stuck in his own small world, stuck in his comforting synagogue with his like-minded congregants. He was suspicious and mistrustful of outsiders. He was especially skeptical of this illiterate, itinerant preacher who comes from who knows where. Blinders shuttered his heart and his life. He was not alive. But he listens, but as he listens to the story of the man, beaten, robbed, and left half dead, and the cold Levite and the detached priest, those blinders begin to fall away. And as he learns of the Samaritan heretic caring for his neighbor, the neighbor who has no identity, who may be from a faraway land, different culture and foreign faith. Our, expert heart, our expert's heart opens to compassion. He sees that the good neighbor is the one who had mercy on him. Our expert learns that tribe doesn't matter. Only kindness does. Without a heart thirsting for justice, thirsting for kindness, thirsting for mercy, and thirsting for compassion, the law, love your neighbor as yourself, is a dead letter. Something to be studied by experts. But as our expert listens, he comes to understand that the Samaritan heretic's thirst for justice, kindness, and mercy gives life to the law. It's the Samaritan's compassionate heart that fuels his actions, bandaging the wounds, pouring on oil and wine, putting the man on his donkey, bringing him to the inn, taking care of him there, paying two days' wages to the innkeeper to cover expenses, promising to return to pay for any additional expense. These kindnesses and these merciful acts give life to the law. If we do likewise, we will also be given life, not in some future eternity, but now, here, today. Let our hearts not be cold. Let our stereotypes and tribal instincts melt away. Let our hearts be warm welcoming, inclusive. Let us be kind, not just to those in our small circle, but to whoever is hurting, to whoever is next to us, whenever and wherever we encounter her. Let us not walk by on the other side. Let us not lo love in words or speech but with actions and with mercy. Like that Samaritan heretic, let us love with our actions. And like the Samaritan heretic, let us love with our hearts, passionate for mercy, kindness, and justice. Let us do this, and then we will live here, now.
today. Thank you, Bruce, for those inspiring words. It's powerful. Um, as you are able, would you stand, please, and join in singing with me uh, song number 2172, and you'll find that in the black book. But the words are on the screen. this place filled with God's spirit to walk humbly with God and to serve one another. Go in peace. Amen.